science seminar today. It is our distinct pleasure to have Dr. Gary DeBoer and the Chem 1113 players with us today. <laughs> Dr. DeBoer was born at a very early age in Iowa and started acting <laughs> up almost immediately. After his initial four years in performance, he went to Calvin College in Michigan to develop his chemical expertise and study with eminent personalities. He returned to Iowa to further his knowledge and craft at the University of Iowa. After searching for some years for an appropriate venue for his talents, he arrived at Laterna University about 20 years ago. He has continued to display his acting and scientific abilities and has amazed crowds ever since, including many of you, right? <laughs> he is joined today by an outstanding group of associates from literally all over the world. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Gary DeBoer and the Chem 1113 players. <laughs> Imagine the New Mexico desert. A modern building of concrete, steel, and glass appears over the sandy horizon. Upon looking into the building through an imagined hole in the top, you see large cylindrical stainless steel structures with hoses and electrical cords attached to them. Nearby are large rectangular boxes, some off-white, some orange. Between the steel cylinders and the boxes are black tables full of mirrors and round glass lenses. The Space Force needs a fuel that can both uh, that we can use in both our rockets and our thrusters. Maybe we could use these ionic liquids. But we don't understand the fundamental chemistry of those ionic liquids. We need a physical <laughs> chemist. I know. Let's get Dr. DeBoer from Laterno University. What are you waiting for? Go get that guy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. DeBoer from Laterno University. Good to meet you. All right. Very good. All right. Let me tell you about ionic liquids. Here we go. So, here we go. Here are some examples of ionic liquids. Okay. When you think of ionic salts, you usually don't think of them as being liquids. You think of them as being hard, crystalline substances. But these are organic salts. You can see these, I would like to say, ugly organic things up front there, but um, Dr. Hathaway might disagree. Okay? And they make them liquids, even oftentimes at room temperature. So there are some example cations up on the top and some anions down on the bottom. Now, we want to look at the fundamental properties of these ionic liquids. And one of those fundamental properties is what we call charge transfer, where you transfer a charge from the anion to the cation, and you end up with two neutral species up there on the top, A and B. So we can have direct charge transfer, or we can have an indirect charge transfer, okay? where you can first excite the cation, exciting an electron in the cation to an excited state, and then the electron from the anion donates into that empty orbital back on the cation. But either way, we end up with neutrals on a neutral surface after charge transfer. Now, all of my general chemistry students would understand a diagram like this because they all know about Hess's law and that enthalpy is a what kind of function? A state function. Okay? So if we know some of these energies like the charge transfer energy and maybe the, and the um, electron affinity and things like this, we can figure out other things from this diagram if we can fill in all the different parts. You guys, in general chemistry, you learn about electron affinities, you learn about ionization potentials, you learn about van der Waals forces. All this stuff is you know, general chemistry one and two type of stuff. So we're interested in exploring these fundamental properties of ionic liquids. Note that if the IP is less than the electron affinity, then the charge transfer is going to be greater than the ionization dissociation limit. We can dissociate these ions into two separate ions with um, that sort of energy. So we want to look at these energies and see if we can measure them and see what's going to happen. Because um, if we use these in rocket fuels and thrusters, this stuff is going to be out there in space. It's going to be open to cosmic radiation, right? What will be the result of that kind of interaction? All right, so how are we going to study that? This is what we've got here. 
This is those big stainless steel cylinders that you were imagining just a minute ago. What we have is the sample comes in over here, carried by a helium gas. It flows over our ionic liquid, which is heated here to a pretty high temperature to get enough vapor pressure off of this ionic liquid. And then that mixture of gases is released through a pulsed valve into a big vacuum chamber where it goes in as a column here, a supersonic molecular beam, we call it, where these molecules are separated from each other in time and space. And we can then explore them with the tool of a physical chemist, which is a laser. So laser beams come in, intersect this molecular beam of stuff, ionize them, and those ionized things then fly up through this, what we call a flight tube of a time of flight mass spectrometer. And then we measure what things we ionize there and determine what they are based on their masses. All right, so this is the instrument of the physical chemist, one of his tools, okay? The other tool the physical chemist has is the laser, okay? And what we can use is one laser there comes in, intersects the beam, and excites the charge transfer band. And then we have these guys on a neutral surface. We can bring in another laser to ionize the neutrals, A plus, for example, and then that A plus could be detected in our mass spectrometer. Okay. Or we could use a couple of lasers in what we call a resonance enhanced multi photon ionization of the B guy here to a cation and then detect him with our time of flight mass spectrometer. Yes? So we can explore these things on their different surfaces, their ionic surface and their um, neutral surface. Another thing we can do, because we like lasers in physical chemistry, is add another laser. Okay? Once we get the first guy up to the neutral surface, we can hit him with what we call an infrared laser and just excite vibrational modes in this um, complex of A and B. And then ionize that thing and see if we can detect um, vibrational energies within our complex. Right? So that's a, that's a second laser. Now, you know, as physical chemists, we can put these lasers in any order that we want to. So we might also um, put that IR laser first and look at the vibrational energies of it, this complex as an ionic liquid before we put it up onto the neutral surface and then ionize it again. So these are all techniques of the physical chemist. And we can use these then to understand these fundamental properties of ionic liquids, which is important to the Air Force when we use these things either in um, the stratosphere or up in outer space. Okay, now <clears throat> let me tell you the results of these experiments. <clears throat> yes, sir? Hi. I'm from the AFRL Tech Engagement Office. We're looking for patentable inventions in our offices, in our labs. Wow, well I've been working here in the laser lab, but I'm also a registered patent attorney. Awesome. So can I, can we talk? Awesome. Can we talk? Yeah, let's go do that. Nobody was interested <laughs> in this stuff anyway. Okay. So here we go. <clears throat> Drop that scene one. Okay. Imagine yourself in the New Mexico desert. An office building appears over the horizon. Upon looking into the building through an imagined hole, in the top, you see numerous halls and small offices with worn carpets and electric mix of government furniture. Oh man, I've been going over these reports and I gotta tell you, the Air Force needs more patents. I mean, look at this. The Navy's beating us like crazy. <sighs> if only there was a way that our scientists and engineers could disclose more of their patentable inventions. I know this guy. I met him last summer. He's a registered physical chemist, and he's a patent agent. He was working in the laser labs. His name's Dr. DeBoer. Really? Well, what are you waiting for? Let's get that guy over here. Hi, I'm Gary DeBoer. I'm here to tell you about how we can have our scientists and our patent attorneys all learn about IP. Take a seat. Let me tell you. Oh, 
All right, so let's tell you a little bit about the Air Force Research Lab if this works, okay? Here's what we do. Lead, discover, develop, deliver. The Air Force Research Laboratory leads the discovery, development, and delivery of war fighting technologies for our air, space, and cyber forces. Our scientists, researchers, and professionals reimagine what's possible, creating tomorrow's technology today. This pursuit innovation delivers solutions for our warfighters' urgent needs, creating innovative new capabilities for the Air Force. When others say it's impossible, we find a way. We are the Air Force Research Laboratory. Right, so cool. So the mission of the Air Force Research Laboratory is to provide this cutting edge technology for the Air Force and for the, the people who use this stuff in the Air Force. And part of this is to take discoveries from the Air Force, get them out into um, industry where they're manufactured, and then those things that are produced can come back into the Air Force where we can discover new things based on that technology. So to do this um, transfer in and out of the Air Force, we need to patent this technology and license it to the outside agencies who then manufacture that thing um, and deliver the Air Force a product and give it the Air Force revenue based on the agreements in those licensing agreements. So we're in this cycle of technology, in and out, okay? And here's, um, I, don't, I don't know if this is Mufasa or Simba. Anybody know? Simba. This is Simba, okay. Either way, it's the circle of life that you may remember from the Disney show, okay? So we're looking at this circle of life. This is the technology life, yes? Things come, are born, and then they, they die. And we're interested in the, the birth part of technology here. You guys invent something, okay? We have to evaluate that thing to see if it's a patentable thing. If it's patentable, we want to patent it and protect it, send it out to industry with a license, have them manufacture it and bring it back into the Air Force so that we can build the next exciting innovation here. So how do we know if something is going to be patentable? Yes? Well, here are three questions that you can ask based on the three laws of patentability. Okay? USC 101, USC 102, and USC 103. Okay? So USC 101 says something like this. Okay? It says, whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof may obtain a patent, therefore, subject to the conditions and requirements of this title. So what does this mean? It means that a process is patentable, like the Haber process for producing ammonia could be patentable. Okay? Here's a machine. We call it a what? Sewing machine. It even has machine in the word. So it's obviously a machine, okay? There you go. A manufacturer, what's a manufacturer? Okay, a chair might be an article that is manufactured, yes? So things that are made in factories like this are um, a manufacturer. And the last one is a what? Composition. Composition of matter. So we're back to what again? Science. Chemistry again, yes. Composition of matter. So these are the four statutory categories of patentable things, okay? All right. So um, we can also look at what we call novelty, okay? Here's USC 102, which is novelty. A person shall be entitled to a patent unless the claimed invention was patented, described in a printed publication or in public use on sale or otherwise available to the public before the effective filing date of the claimed invention, yes? And then the second one here basically says if somebody invents it and files it before you do, you're out of luck, <laughs> yes? All right, so let's take a, a look at some examples here of this, okay? Here we have um, Dr. Baumer over in engineering, okay? He invents a new welding machine, right? And the whole class uses it for a month, okay? So go back to USC 102 here, okay? And what does it say? 
you can get a patent unless it's in what? Public use. Public use. Now the question is, Dr. Baumer's laboratory, is that a public use? Yep. Maybe. Or is it a what? A private use. You could certainly make the claim that this is a private use. Only those invited into the lab can use it. It's not open to the public, except for maybe for tours, when he can put a drape over this thing or something like that, and he might be okay. All right, let's look at Dr. Jameson, our new chemistry faculty. She invents a new chemical process and presents it at an American Chemical Society conference last month. Okay, going back to the law here, is that a public disclosure? Is it available to the public if she talks about it at an American Chemical Society conference? Pretty much anybody can come to American Chemical Society conferences. They're pretty much open to the public. So what do we think about poor Dr. Jameson? Can she still patent this? Not according to the law, not according to USC 102, as it's written here. All right, let's go to Dr. Sasaki. Anybody know Dr. Sasaki? Yeah, yeah, nice guy, right? He invents this new prosthetic and published it two years ago in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Can um, Dr. Sasaki still patent this thing? No, there it is, in a printed publication. It's in there somewhere, right? A printed publication, right there. Printed publication. So, too bad for Dr. Sasaki. Okay, we've got one more inventor here. Dr. Medlin invents a new welding machine and keeps it secret. Well, that's good. No public disclosures, at least, like those other people did, right? But the Cedarville faculty independently comes up with the same idea and files a patent application for the same invention. Can Dr. Medlin still file? Ah, well, that depends, right? What's paragraph two here under A say? The claimed invention was described in a patent issued under this section or an application for patent published or deemed published <laughs> under this other section in which somebody else, it names another as the inventor. So can Dr. Medlin still try to get a patent? No, he's out of luck. Another filed for this, same idea, okay? Too bad for Dr. Medlin. Okay, now, one thing that I've learned about the law is you have to read the entire law, not just paragraph A, okay? There's a paragraph B, yes? Exceptions to paragraph A. Yes, this is the loopholes that you're looking for as a student and as an inventor. Yes? <laughs> All right. Okay. So it says here, okay, here's your exception in big, bold letters. Exceptions to A, disclosures made one year or less before the effective filing date of the claimed invention. These then don't count to stop you from claiming the invention. So keep that idea in mind and let's um, look at these things again, okay? So Dr. Balmer, okay? So he's using this thing for a month in his class. Does it even matter now if it's public or private? No, so long as he does what? Files within a year, okay? So that public-private use debate goes away. Um, what about Dr. Jameson? Is she okay? Yeah, it was just what, last month, okay? So she's all right, she can still file within another 11 months, and she can be okay. All right, what about Dr. Sasaki? Two years ago, he's run out of grace. There's only so much grace in the world, and so Dr. Sasaki ran out of it. Okay. What about Dr. Medlin? Nope, somebody still beat him. It doesn't matter, right? Okay. He's still out of luck there. So at least we saved two out of four of these things, right? Okay. Which is not too bad, right? Okay, so let's look at, um, here's the whole, par here's, um, whole USC 102, paragraph A and paragraph B. And the thing to note here, if you don't remember anything else from this talk years from now, okay, is that after your public disclosure, you have what? One year. One year of grace. And it's much better to file before you disclose than after. But if you already disclosed, you still have one year of grace in which to file your patent application. All right, that leads us then to um, the third law here, a law with respect to obviousness, okay? All right, so this is how it reads. This is the whole thing here, okay? It says, a patent for a claimed invention may not be obtained, even if, that's what notwithstanding means, 
even if the claimed invention is okay under USC 102 and 101. But if the differences between the claimed invention and the stuff that's already out there is not much, that would be obvious to somebody skilled in the art to put these things together, we're not going to give you a patent for it. Right? So the question, the obvious question then is what? What is obviousness? That's the obvious question to ask. All right. So what does it mean to be obvious? That means different things to different people, right? And who are the people who decide these things? Well, let's see if you can decide. Here are some examples. All right. Dr. Dittenberg. Okay. He's into making roads. Right? And he's got this asphalt machine thing. And he adds a heating element onto the chassis of the asphalt laying machine to make sure the asphalt flows nice and smoothly onto the roadway. Okay? And this asphalt laying machine has already been known and out there. Yes? And the heating thing machine is already known and out there. Can Dr. Dittenberg get a patent based on this combination of these two parts into something that he says is new? Who says yes? I heard a yes. Somebody said yes. They won't admit it now. Oh, one person over there. Who says no? Okay. Well, this is the question, right? And so this goes to the Supreme Court, right? And the Supreme Court says no. Why? Because they're both obvious. They're already known. Yeah. Well, they're already known, and it's obvious to combine them. All Wittenberg had to do was bolt this one thing onto the end of the other thing. Anybody could do that, they said, right? Anybody who does asphalt making machines would know how to do that, right? Not a hard thing to do, obvious thing to do. So poor Dr. Dittenberg, he fails under USC 103. Okay, now Dr. Hathaway here, right? Okay, he's the chemist, right? He makes this new drug, or takes an old drug, sorry, takes an old drug, and he puts two coatings on this drug, okay? And um, most of the time, people just put one coating on the drug. And Dr. Hathaway would tell you that the coating that people put on drugs is to prevent the drug from being destroyed by the acid in your gut before they can get into your intestine and dissolve into your bloodstream. Okay? So people have used these coatings before, right? People have made these drugs before. But now Dr. Hathaway puts two coatings on his drug. Is that new or is it just obvious to put more coatings? Okay. Who says it's an obvious thing to do? Okay. Yeah. Who says it's not obvious? Okay. Well, this one you need a little more background information, right? Okay. These things are hard to judge just based on these descriptions alone. <laughs> so here's the background information, right? We know that the coating is to prevent the drug from being destroyed by the stomach acid. Yes? All right. But the problem was with some drugs, the coating actually destroyed the drug. That's a problem, right? So what Dr. Hathaway did is he used a different coating to prevent the drug from being damaged by the first coating. So this is a new use for the coating. It's not to protect the drug from the stomach, right? It's used to protect the drug from the what? From the coating. Okay? And the Supreme Court decided, hey, Dr. Hathaway, that's pretty smart of you. That's a clever new use, an inventive sort of way to use old stuff. Yes? And so Dr. Hathaway gets a, a, a patent on this. All right. Let's give him a big hand. All right. Okay. All right. So the Supreme Court, while deciding these decisions, came up with what they call these little outlines to help you um, determine what is obvious and what's not. That's called the Graham versus John Deere case back in 1966. And so here's the steps that you go through. You determine the scope and the content of the stuff that's already out there. Okay, what is already out there? Well, drugs are out there. Coatings are out there. Asphalt laying machines are out there. Heating elements are out there. Yes? And it says, well, what's the difference between that old stuff and what you're claiming as new stuff? Yes? And then the question is, would somebody of ordinary skill in the art be able to do that? If that is true, somebody of ordinary skill in the art would be able to put these things together, then it's obvious. There has to be something more than just anybody being able to put this thing together. You've got to show why it was impossible to put the asphalt laying machine together with the heating element on it. If you can do that and show how you invented a new idea, how to get that done, then, then you're okay. All right. So 
There's a couple other secondary considerations you can talk about. You can talk about unexpected results, right? You can talk about long felt need. Yes, if there's this long felt need for 30 years because of this problem and nobody's been able to fix that problem, but you come up with one, then you can say, hey, it can't be obvious or somebody else would have done this 30 years ago. Yes, you can always make that argument. Usually it doesn't go very far, but you can try. Yes, all right. So that's the big um, question there, obviousness. So anyway, um, I spent my summer over there at the Air Force working on these things with um, inventors, with patent attorneys, and all kinds of stuff. I had a lot of fun. And um, it was great because they gave me this badge and let me in every place. Right? And I could talk to anybody. They gave me like an interim security clearance thing or whatever it was. I don't know what it was, but they told me everything. And I learned all kinds of stuff, yes, that I can't tell you about. And it made me feel really smart, and it gave me this big head, you know. And, and then we had this party at the end of the summer, yes? Mm -hmm. And um, it was this fancy banquet thing, right? And they passed out all the awards, and all these inventors that I've been working with, you know, introduced me to their family and told their family how much they appreciated me and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, wow. This is the life. This is great. I'm not getting dirty in the lab anymore. My eyes aren't all gooey because I'm looking at laser beams and things. You know, wow. I mean, why didn't I do this, you know, years ago? I mean, this is awesome. And then after the banquet, we went to this baseball game, right? Yes. And they had one of these, um, you know, those big fancy booth things in the top of the stadium? Yeah, we were in those. Yeah, and they had all this food out there, the after dinner food. Yes, it was out there, and you know, they had TVs in this little room up there, and you could watch the Fox. game out, or you could go out, yeah, box seats, that's what they call them, right? <coughs> Not the only rich people go to these things, right? And I'm like, rich living people. like a rich person. I mean, this was amazing, because I grew up in Iowa on a farm. This was new <laughs> stuff for me, yes, you know? So, you know, you come to the stadium, and there's this big line where people go to get their tickets and stuff, and then, I didn't have to go through that line. I went to the VIP entrance, mm -hmm. and they put this little thing on me. They said, oh, so nice to see you, Dr. D. Well, come right this way. <laughs> Woo! Man, I mean, this is like good stuff. I just took a picture of that, see? <laughs> VIP, right? And I took it home to my wife. See, they think I'm important here. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this was good. Okay. So anyway, I'm all excited about this stuff. But you can see that there's a big map over the baseball field here because it was kind of sprinkling and they hadn't opened up the field. So they kept delaying the game for 10 minutes and then for 20 minutes. But we're all still hanging out there, just chatting and talking. Anyway, so I get kind of bored, start thinking about some other things and um, stuff like that. And then I start thinking to myself, wow, you know, all these people that I worked with all summer, or just about all of them, are white men. All the scientists were white men. All the people in the tech engagement office were what? White, white men. Yeah, yeah. It was just, I thought, this is really kind of weird. Iowa. So white. It's kind of like going back to Iowa. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Somebody said that. Yeah, like Iowa. But no wonder I feel so at home here, right? <laughs> anyway, it made me wonder, what are, the, what are the stats on these things, right? Is it, you know? so. I, you know, my wife gave me this phone for Father's Day, and I could like pull up stuff on the internet on my phone. So I thought I'd check that out and see what I could do. And here's some stuff from the NSF. Here on the right is um, the current U.S. population. 31% is white men, right? 31% white women, and so forth and so on. But if you look at who's represented nationally in the United States anyway, with respect to um, science and engineering occupations, almost 49% are what? White men. That's half. That's half. Yeah, that's half. At the Air Force, it was much, much, much more than half. I bet it was like 90 plus percent were white men. Okay? Anyway, who's not represented and should be represented? Who's the big gap here? Out there. White women. White women are dropping it here, right? They're going from 31% over there down to what? 18% over there. Yep. Black men are not quite represented, but it's not as big a drop as over there. Unless you go by half of them, then I guess it's a big drop. Yes? But clearly, you know, in science and engineering, we have what? 
more white men than his uh, proportionate population. So I thought, wow, well maybe, you know, my experience with these um, scientists and stuff that are there are just the old crowd, and maybe the new crowd of incoming scientists and engineers will have a different um, sort of makeup. So um, I checked that out, okay. Here's the space, or the, we call them summer scholars or space scholars, okay. And this is for the year 13, 14, and 15, okay. And there it is up there for, um, yeah. yeah, there's no female. There's some white guy that wrote this up. Hey, I'm the one who noticed. Oh, yeah, you're the one who noticed. Good. Kudos for you. All right. That's the French spelling. Ah, there you go. French spelling. You can understand that. But here you can see that amongst the, these are the college kids. These are your undergrad college <coughs> who are coming to the Air Force to work in the summer in an REU type of thing. Okay? And look at their makeup. 83% are what? Men. Now, of these men, okay, what's the breakdown with respect to their um, ethnicity? Okay? Okay? And there's, if you add all these guys up, there's about 111 or something of them. Okay, these aren't percents here. But if you look in this year, it's 81 out of about 111 that are what? White. Okay? So you do the math, you take about 80% times 81 over 111, and you get about then 58% are male, and they are what? White, okay? That's the young crowd. Yes, that's the up and coming group at the Air Force here, okay? So 58% is still bigger than that national average of what? 49%, and certainly much bigger than the 31% that's represented in the U.S. population. So anyway, this kind of bum me out a little bit. Kind of sad to think about this, you know, after feeling so good about myself. You know, just when you're feeling good, you know, that's when, you know, the world crashes on you. Wow, what am I involved in here, right? Yes, this is like, you know, the kingdom of white men sort of thing, you know? And then, well, here, let me tell you some more things here before I tell you the next story. All right, if you're interested in a summer position with the Air Force, these are, these are them broken down. So you can see most of them are in what? Yeah, airspace and astronautical engineering. A lot of space-based stuff in the Air Force. <clears throat> For the Space Force, well, basically, that's, that's what it is, right? Okay, a lot of electrical engineers. And look here, you engineering physics people. Lots of you. Okay, so engineering physics people, you need a summer job, fly to the Air Force Research Lab. All right. Anyway, that's all that. Lots of opportunities out there in space-related things. Okay, then I started thinking, ah, man, all this white kingdom stuff, right? And then uh, my daughter texts me on my phone. My daughter is always a challenge to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oldest daughter. And she says, Dad, you used to be a Peace Corps volunteer. You're an academic. What are you doing working for the Department of Defense? And I text back, well, you know, we're here to get the bad guy, you know? And she texts me back, but Dad, don't you know that sometimes we're the bad guys? And I said, well, you can't blame these guys for that. You know, that's the public's fault for telling them to do something they shouldn't be doing, right? And I had this little conversation with her by text there, but that made me feel worse, too. <laughs> yes, you know, because she's really smart, and she can always win the argument. So, anyway, then I start thinking about Eisenhower. Remember Eisenhower? Yeah, this is Eisenhower, right? This is what he said. Okay. Yeah, well, okay, but you may remember parents talking about it. Okay? He was before there. <laughs> 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 my parents were teaching. So let's listen to what Eisenhower has to say about this whole thing. years past the midpoint of a century that has witnessed four major wars among great nations. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women 
are directly engaged in the defense establishment. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizen can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. Wow, even spiritual, did you hear that? What's the implications of this military-industrial complex? How was I a tool of it? I begin to wonder about that. You know, I was prepared to come back to the Cornell University. <laughs> the Trump in there. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, and I wonder, okay, so there's spiritual implications to this industrial complex type of stuff. Yes, industry, tech transfer, right? How would the Cornell University, as a Christian polytechnic university, right, address this whole issue of the industrial complex? Imagine the East Texas Piney Woods. A modern building of concrete, steel, and glass appears on a grassy university campus. Upon looking into the building through an imagined hole in the top, you see nicely decorated and well-furnished offices and conference rooms. We need to get back to our institutional roots. What, like technology and stuff? More like Christian polytechnic. Yeah, but then we'll have to produce technology, you know, patents and stuff, if we're to be, uh, if we're to have any integrity. Who I'd, can help us with that? I think I might know a guy. What are you waiting for? Get that man here. Hi, I'm Gary. <laughs> <laughs> A modern building of concrete, steel, and glass appears on a grassy university campus. Upon looking into the building through an imagined hole in the top, you see a very nice presentation room filled with beautiful students and faculty engaged in deep, meaningful conversations about science, technology, and patent law. So here we are. We're living in Act 3. Yes, this is the end times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, faith and science integrated there. All right, so this Christian polytechnic thing, right? You know, I was wondering about the whole military industrial complex. When I come back to my office, okay, and what's on my desk? This little book by um, our own Steve Mason, entitled what? A Pro Book Perspective. Yeah. Yeah, embracing the saga of our unique organizational call. So that, wow! Well, I bet Steve Mason has the answer to this, right? Yes? How do we integrate our technology into life in a Christian sort of way? Yes? How can we do that? Well, you know, I got together with um, Paul Boggs to talk about this, and we came up with this um, little proposal that we gave to Mr. Mason, okay? or uh, what we call the Provost Grant, yes? And Dr. Mason thought that was a cool idea, okay? We call it Laterno Ingenuity Center, or LIC. Because it takes a LIC to keep on ticking. Yeah, there we go. Renewing faith and ingenuity. A long time ago, I don't know if you guys know, we used to have this tagline that says, um, Ingenuity, 
ingenuity brings us together. Nope. Oh, that's not it. Faith brings us together. What? Ingenuity sets us apart. You guys know it. There you go. So it's up there, huh? Yeah. There you go. That's a good deal. So let's um, renew faith and ingenuity. And can we do it as a Christian polytechnic <coughs> university? The Laternal Ingenuity Center here is what we're going to talk about for a couple minutes here in Act 3. So what we're looking for are your inventions. Yes? Right? We want to know, what have you come up with? Yes? What's going on here? Okay. If you don't have a patentable invention, too bad for you. Else, if you do, right, if you can complete an invention disclosure form, the provost has authorized us to give you money. $200. Okay? All right. So if you complete an invention disclosure form telling us about your invention, yes? Right, and we can process it here at the Christian Polytechnic University. You'll get some money for that, just for the invention disclosure. Right? So we want you. We want to renew faith and ingenuity. Yes? R.G. Laterno had how many patents? Anybody know? Yeah, over 200. Yes? Okay. How many patents have been given to the university since R.G. Laterno? Not really. Two. Yeah. Yeah. And one was even from a Laterno faculty. Okay. So we want you. Yes? We actually what? <laughs> Need you. Okay? And here's something to think about. Only scientists and engineers can practice patent law. Right? So where are patent attorneys and patent agents going to come from? Here. Here. Maternal. They're not going to come from a pre-law program that has everybody majoring in history or poli-sci. Those guys can't do patent law. They won't be allowed to even sit the exams, right? So we need you in this area, right? <coughs> Where will patent agents and patent trainees come from? Well, they're going to come from Laternal University here, right? Do you hear the calling? Okay. You know, maybe your vision of law is, you know, Perry Mason, criminal courts, yes? Or maybe it's those guys that chase the ambulances or something like that, right? Yeah, always looking for a fat buck or something, yes? I mean, we have lots of bad impressions of people in law, right? Don't we? But what about the patent attorneys and the patent agents? Yes, the people who are helping scientists and engineers get their stuff patented, licensed, and manufactured so that we can all make use of those things. Yeah, I think this is a good calling. I think this is a good place for you guys to go. So if you're interested at all in law, you should think about this as part of a pre-law type program. Yes? Because the only place that patent attorneys and patent agents are going to come from are where? Here. Here. Places like Laterno. Yes. Okay. So, now, let me tell you this. You guys are really lucky because this is registration week. Yes? And you can register for a course in what? In patent law, right? It's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 11.45, to whenever it gets out, okay? All right. And this can help you both as a practicing scientist and engineer to know a little bit about the laws that you'll be working underneath. And also, it might give you a flavor for law if you're at all interested in doing something um, after you become an engineer maybe in a, in a few years or so, you know, morph into something else as you grow in your career. All right, so all that stuff is pretty good. Yes? So you want to do it before the banana hits the floor. That's getting pretty <laughs> close, right? Okay. Now, that's the end here. And now we're going to have a little curtain call here to um, celebrate all of our, our actors in here. So please applaud for those as they come up to the front.